All right, children, we are on chapter 11, which is all about forestry. Du, 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 du. So 11.1, we're gonna be talking about resource management. We've talked about resources a lot before. Um, at the beginning of the year, we talked about overfishing and how because of the tragedy of the commons and nobody owns the ocean, that everybody goes in there and fishes as many fish as quickly as they can to make profit. The problem is they're not preserving any fish. And so over the years, our fish stock has decreased by 60% over the last 40 years. That's huge and it's really problematic. So when it comes to resources, we need to have good plans on how to manage these natural resources. All right, so renewable resource management, remember that resources are either renewable or non-renewable. Renewable includes things that our planets can um, regenerate, so when you think renewable, you usually think of things like wind and solar and all that is true. Um, but biofuels are renewable as well because you can grow them back. And water is usually renewable. So as long as we don't use it faster than it's produced, it is still renewable. So non-renewable, the classic example of that, of course, is fossil fuels because it takes uh, millions to billions of years to create fossil fuels. And so we are using them much, much, much faster than they are produced. So our goal environmentally is to be sustainable. And that means that the resource that we use it only as fast as it can be naturally replaced. So that keeps it renewable. And by it being renewable, it makes it sustainable that you can keep using it uh, in, well into the future. So we need to balance uh, human and ecological needs. And I'd like to throw in there too, that you also have to balance the economic needs right along with that, which is considered a human need. Because if you don't make something function economically, humans are not gonna buy into it. And that's a reoccurring theme in environmental issues. So something we look at for how is the best way to harvest the most natural products without damaging the resource? And so what we look at is the maximum sustainable yield or MSY. So we can do this um, by keeping track of population sizes. So whether it's tree populations, fish populations, deer populations, whatever it is. And so what we're looking at is what is the actual carrying capacity of that population? The carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that that ecosystem can sustain indefinitely. So there's enough, just enough food fresh water uh, and shelter for those species. And so we see in the species as they glow, grow is they usually start slow growth and then they have exponential growth and then they slow down as they approach the carrying capacity. So what we really want is to keep our populations below carrying capacity so they keep growing fast. And so your maximum sustainable yield is gonna obviously affect species as you are removing them from the ecosystem. And that's something that you have to keep track of as well. So looking at our maximum sustainable yield, we do this all the time. That's why we have hunting licenses. So they look at what can be the minimum breeding stock for the population. And so they're like, okay, we cannot let the population dip below here or it will not rebound when they reproduce. So for example, if we talk about white-tailed deer, so white-tailed deer have this minimum breeding stock that we must maintain that our environment can sustain indefinitely. Now, when they reproduce in the spring, the population gets larger than the carrying capacity, and we can estimate how much that is gonna be based on the number of breeding stock that we make sure we keep, keep in the population. And then we know, hey, this is the number that when we do our hunting license that we can give out for people to reasonably remove from the population without removing our breeding stock here. All right, and we do also have to keep in mind that species die off for these other reasons as well. So like starvation, which also, if we remove species from the ecosystem and keep it back down at carrying capacity, it will take away some of these issues. But starvation, disease, accidents, weather, uh, illegal hunting without a permit, uh, predators and other issues will all reduce the population. And so we have to have these estimates based on how the population did in previous years to make this successful. So again, the idea is we have rapid growth, slow growth at the beginning, right? And then rapid growth and then growth approaches zero. And so we wanna remove individuals somewhere in the middle here 
when we're using this, okay? So if we held the population at 65,000 individuals for this species of wildebeest, then we could, or sorry, 650,000 individuals. So then we could harvest 65,000 each year safely without it really impacting the population because they'll have that many babies the next year. So this number is the maximum sustainable yield that they calculated that we can remove from the population every single year without impacting the population that they will rebound. So we would harvest basically 10% each year of the population. And the population size would be at 650 because it would come, they would come right back essentially. So if we're looking at overfishing, for example, you don't want to fish too little where you're not you're under utilizing your stock and then you're not going to be making as much profit and people aren't going to buy into that if you overfish then you're going to reduce the number of fish you have over time and that's actually going to ruin the fishing industry and this is what we're seeing right now where people are having a hard time sustaining their industry so what we really need to do is do somewhere in the middle uh, where we're dealing with our maximum sustainable yield and actually using math and science to say hey how many is an appropriate number of fish that we remove from this ecosystem and how are we going to do it? So this idea of an ecosystem-based management can also apply to our forests, okay? So when it comes to our forests, we're looking at to harvest uh, the maximum number of trees without disturbing the ecosystem to such a point that the ecosystem does not work. And so this is a difficult thing to do. It's, it takes a lot of research and balance and a lot of people working together, um, but it's especially important in ecological sensitive areas. And so we have to monitor these and keep track of them. And that's what ecologists do. And then they harvest the resources within these areas selectively. So that means you're being very purposeful about what you are pulling from those forests. We have to remember that ecosystems are very, very complex. So choosing which areas we're going to protect and which to harvest from can be very difficult because predicting how different species or the land itself will respond can be hard. So this down here is an example of clear cutting. Um, this is something that is in practice that is absolutely the worst for an ecosystem. And so we're going to talk about what we could do differently. So adaptive forest management is the goal is to gather data because all this is data driven um, to manage the forest in many different ways and have a customized management plan based on the result. So each forest has their own plan based on that ecosystem. What kind of trees are there? How much waterfall do they get? How fast do the trees grow? Um, what's the canopy like? What other species live in that area? And they continually monitor them. So what this guy's doing over here in this picture is he's taking a bore of the tree and what is this little core that will come out of there and he'll be able to look at that and figure out how how old the tree is how much rain this forest has experienced because all based on the rings in the tree so of course this process is very time consuming um, and can be very challenging depending on the forest you're trying to get to So this is the cycle of adaptive management. I put this in your notes. So this is from the National Park Service. So um, all of it always starts with um, looking at your system. And you'll notice that it's circular because it's always going on and you're repeating things. So if you are monitoring a forest, you're gonna look at the outcomes of all the data that you collect and figure out what was learned about your forest. You're gonna take that knowledge and you're gonna use it to assess the entire field and then make a management plan and then design your actions. Like how, what are we gonna remove? When are we gonna remove it? Um, and then we're gonna implement those things. And then once you implement them, you go back to monitoring to see what effects are gonna occur, evaluate that, and the process just continues over and over and over again. So we do this in the forest, not just with the trees themselves, but also the species that live in there. So uh, grizzly bear populations, a couple of years ago, not that long ago, grizzlies were very much in the news because they opened up um, during the Trump administration, they opened up so that people could hunt bears while they were in their caves during hibernation, which before that was very much un not allowed, okay? 
And they did this because if you look at the number of females with cubs, that was increasing. So the bear populations were actually doing a little bit better, but we have limited area for the bears. And so they were increasing the hunting probably to keep these bear populations in check. The problem is the range of the bears has shrunk over time. So yes, we're letting them hunt them to keep the population in check, but the population would not be a problem if they were spread out to the actual areas that they used to take. So the blue line is where they were monitoring. Um, the yellow line is the recovery zone for grizzly bears, which you can see is not very large. And then the grizzly bears occupied range actually spread out from there. And so they're trying to keep the population in check. But if, then if you look at current range versus historic range, they're actually just going into places where they were before, which is more natural. But the other problem is these are, are highly populated areas where they're coming in contact with people. So even though we would love for them to have the range that they have, you also can't have people in danger due to this species. And so it is a delicate balance. So now let's start talking specifically more about our forests. Um, and right now our forests cover about 30% of the Earth's land, which sounds like a lot, but that number is dropping drastically due to deforestation. So our forests have a lot of value. Of course, they provide habitats for organisms that live there. So they encourage biodiversity, both in animals and plants. Uh, they prevent erosion, which is becoming a bigger and bigger problem with climate change as some places they're experiencing more rain. And then we have things like um, avalanches of soil. Um, they purify our water, which is very important. So they help clean the water during the water cycle. And then, of course, with climate change, they store carbon and they produce oxygen that we all need to breathe. So economically, they're really important too. Timber, of course, is in high demand, uh, both for building and for a fuel source in a lot of places. The forest is also a source for, of food for many uh, native groups and raw materials for many medicines. So you might not know that, but many of our medicines like aspirin originally came from plants in the forest that they were discovered there. So we have different methods for our harvesting our timber. Um, clear cutting, sea treat or shelter wood approach, and a selection system. So these are the three main methods we're going to be looking at. Um, most of them may even result in even aged or uneven aged regrowth. So even age is when all the trees are the same age. So that happens especially with clear cutting. Um, when you clear cut a forest, you cut all the trees down indiscriminately, whether they're large, small, doesn't matter, you cut them all down. And then you replant. Well, that's the good part, right? Is that now in the United States, if you cut down a forest, you do have to replant, which sounds good. It's better than not replanting for sure. But all these trees, little baby trees, are gonna be the same exact age, which means there's not gonna, and they're also typically the same exact type of tree that they're replanting. Um, and so that means you've lost a huge amount of biodiversity. And these little trees are not gonna uh, provide a lot of food or habitat for a lot of different species. So it can be really problematic. Uneven is when you have some big trees and some little trees at different stages. So this can happen both with seed tree and the selection system. And this provides habitat for more of a variety of organisms and food for more variety of organisms. And so uh, environmentally is much more friendly. So let's talk about this. Uh, clear cutting, like I said, involves going into the forest and just cutting everything down in the region, all of them. And replanting in the United States is required, like I said, but then they're all even aged strand, uh, stands of regrowth. So this changes the abiotic conditions. So things like microclimates, uh, the soil gets drier. Uh, you can land up getting some, if you have enough of the forest cut down, it can turn into a desert either, even. Um, the amount of light that comes through changes. It can change the rain because plants contribute to the water cycle. Of course, wind is going to pick up and erode some of the soil off and can cause dust storms. And it's very much going to change the temperature because if you ever go out in the woods and you go under the canopy, you're going to notice it's significantly cooler under the trees than when you're out in the sunshine. The benefit of this is money, all right? It's cost effective for them to bring large equipment in and just cut everything down. But the costs are significant. Um, entire communities are displaced or destroyed, causes massive soil erosion. And so this is some of the things that we're looking at with 
what's happening like in Brazil in our tropical rainforests where we're losing species. Species are going to go extinct like orangutans because of clear cutting. So here is some of the erosion that can occur from clear cutting because when it rains, you can see this side of this mountain here. When this rains, all that soil is just going to run off because it is the roots of the trees that actually hold the soil in place. All right, and erosion can be a very big problem because you can also erode all the way back to man-made structures and then you have something like this occurring right, when water hits it. And in some places, you can even lose entire homes. So a much better approach uh, environmentally is the seed tree and shelter wood approaches. So seed tree is when they go in and they take a small numbers of mature, healthy trees and they don't cut them down. And so they cut all the other ones, but they select some to keep standing. And that does a couple things. One, these guys shelter the little baby trees from bad weather and things like that so that uh, the little baby trees have a better chance of survival. And they also, of course, are better for the ecosystem because it, like I said earlier, provides more habitats for different kinds of species. So we leave those few mature trees and cut everything else down and then you re replant the seedlings. So the benefit, of course, way less damaging than clear cutting to the ecosystem. But the cost is it's harder to do this. You have to work around those trees that you select to stay up. It's going to be more time consuming um, and it is still mostly even aged regrowth because the next time they come back, they're going to cut down these large trees and then you'll be left with all these ones that are the same age but at least temporarily you have some more variety so still much preferred over clear cutting all right and then we have the most prefer, uh, preferred environmentally is selection systems so selection systems is when you go into a forest and you very purposely walk through the forest and select trees that should be removed um, a lot of times they're looking for trees that are are fallen or are going to fall or are in very thickly dense uh, canopied areas so that it'll actually open some light to allow the trees below the seedlings to grow. So relatively few trees are cut at once and so much more biodiversity. It doesn't destroy the ecosystem at all. Uh, any species that were in those few trees can go find uh, habitat elsewhere and all the other mature trees that are at different ages left behind. Uh, it is uneven aged. Like I said, all different sizes and shapes of trees are left behind. Um, you, you don't have to replant as much with this one because the trees will grow back on their own. And so in that way, it could be better for the companies that come in. And that will offset some of the costs of not being able to just clear everything out. Um, this cost, the machinery that is moving through the forest still does damage. Um, it's an expensive process. And of course, very much more dangerous for the loggers because they're working between the other trees to cut these trees down instead of large machinery just coming in and wiping it all out. But deforestation is definitely a huge issue. Uh, deforestation replaces forested areas with other land use. So if you cut a forest down and you let it grow back into a forest, it's not considered deforestation, it's just clear cutting. So deforestation is if you cut it down and you turn it into farmland, and that's what we're seeing in South America. Uh, deforestation in tropical and arid re regions has the most negative effects, especially arid regions, because it tends to turn into desert. So if we look at southern Brazil that I brought up a couple times here, this animation that we went through shows how much we've lost since the 1960s in tropical rainforests, and it is startling the amount of tropical rainforest that has been lost. And the, what is there is not all together. It's isolated in little pockets, which, made, which makes it really hard for species to interbreed with each other and find enough resources. And this is why everybody's concerned. And they can do that because they have really cool equipment. The equipment is cool. So they have machines that can pick up the trees. They saw them right off. Um, they remove all the limbs and then they cut them into pieces that are appropriately sized for the trucks. And then they have other machines that come along and pick these things up and load them on the truck. So they can wipe out a forest very, very quickly. So deforestation in the United States 
By the early 1900s, there was very little old growth forest left over. Um, and that's a forest that had not been logged at all in the United States. So if you look at the map, here is um, the 1820s. This is where all the forest was. In the 1850s, you can see we are already having an impact. By the 1920s, we had very little forest left. And here we are today. And all these little pockets of forest, these are represented by national and state um, parks. All right, so a lot of them are protected forests now. And comparing the two maps, it is startling the amount of forests that we have lost. All right, so the thing we need to keep in mind here that once you cut down some of these large old growth trees, it takes hundreds of years for them to grow back the way they were. So in developing nations, sometimes it's even worse because the timber from old growth tropical rainforest is a source of income and people don't have good incomes there. And so they will, uh, without any forethought, go in there and, and chop trees down to use them. And this has a hugely enormously negative effect on biodiversity for the whole world because rainforests, besides the ocean, are the most biodiverse biome that exists on our planet. 